Um, I, that kind of takes us to uh, a, a broad question we want to throw at you uh, to sort of represent Colorado for us for a moment. We you know we set this sort of context of uh, you know dispossession of native folks, uh, gold rushes. Um, what's uh, what do folks need to think about? Like uh, if we want to look into our time cap or our capsule for Colorado, uh, what do people need to think be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of, um, you know, kind of uh, as we're talking about this in this historical context, um, certainly Colorado, its identity has, you know, it, it, its history is wrapped up in being a frontier state. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, I know you guys were were talking, I guess you're kind of doing some of these uh, state by state looks. And and I listened to um, you guys talking about South Carolina and obviously the, the uh, so much of South Carolina is wrapped up in the early history of slavery and the Civil War. You know, Colorado w wasn't a state until 1876 and really wasn't settled until the early 1860s. And so it kind of takes place in a historical context immediately following that. And you have Western expansion. Um, you know, the, uh, anytime I'm kind of talking about this, I, I recommend folks check out uh, Greg Grandin's book. Uh, end of the myth. It's mm. uh, really fantastic. Just um, study throughout American history about how, how the frontier operated in in American society and sort of um, in the Civil War era was kind of referred to as um, the, the people called it the safety valve. You kind of dissipate sectarian tensions between the North mm -hmm. and South by saying, hey, here's, here's all this free land to the West that Everybody. It's free real estate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and obviously, you know, that 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 worked up to, up until a point and you had bleeding Kansas. But anyway, f you know, following the Civil War and you really have um, Colorado and sort of the interior mountain west being settled. And that's where you have, you know, the the Indian Wars of the 1870s and 1880s really getting into, you know, pretty brutal systematic dispossession of natives. You know, we were talking about treaties. Um in the late 1860s, uh, the U.S. government changed its policy and just said, we're not going to do treaties anymore because we're not going to recognize sovereign sovereignty of, of Native mm -hmm. nations as such. We're just going to deal with them as kind of, you know, internally displaced peoples almost. And, you know, that was that was Colorado. And and um, so it's a it's really important to, to understand understand that as part of the history. Um, and then you have a pretty. Um, you know, uh, Colorado has always been based on commodities and mining and uh, recently oil and gas. Um, that's, that's kind of uh, a big part of our history here. And, you know, uh, I don't know if we want to go all the way to the present day or, or, what you yeah, well, we were touching no, I mean, before we got on about the like uh, the thing that out of staters uh, think about Colorado as uh, like North Dakota, and like I know people's parents are retiring there. Um, so, like, let's talk about uh, as a as a one of the fastest growing uh, states. I'm pretty sure. Uh, what is the, and what's going on internally with the Colorado's economy there? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, just flipping forward all the way to like the the 80s and 90s. You know, back then, I think. Uh, you know, as, as we were talking about before, I'm, I'm a transplant. I've been out here 10 years. Uh, there are lots of, lots of folks like me out here who have been moving here since really since the nineties, uh, especially over the last 10 years. Um, and that influx of, of kind of transplants who are, you know, tend to be, um, upper middle class white have jobs in, you know, the information or tech sectors, um, that's driven, a lot of change in the state politically, you know, it has pretty quickly turned uh, Colorado into a fairly solidly blue state. I mean, it wasn't that long ago when it was, you could, you could really say it was, it was uh, pretty solidly purple, but um, I don't think there's a lot of folks who would, would agree with that anymore. Some of, some of the Democrats kind of, uh, you know, like to say still that it's a purple state in order to justify kind of, running more uh, moderate candidates who they right. feel like they could win. But um, yeah, and, and that's that's been a, a big part of, of the story here. Uh, how and, about pot? Oh, sorry. Yeah, but you no, I mean, I just want to say, and and and, and with that too, like, um, you know, from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, like, um, you know, there's been a, a real threat to 
um, you know, particularly water in the state um, with people using it, you know, some people using it, you know, just to sort of like, you know, vacation property and things like that, more and more pollution and, and like pretty extreme factory farming too. Like, um, you know, whenever we talk about water on this show, like Colorado is a place that seems to be at the top of the list for states that are very, very, um, like they're really reckoning with what I think a lot of people are sort of, you know, assuming the future is going to be like where fights over mm. water and water rights are going to become more and more important politically. Yeah, for sure. It's, you know, it, it is, as you said, it's like mostly, um, you know, we have a, we have a long way to fall, not to say that we couldn't, uh, but we have a long way to fall until, you know, water supplies, um, get to a point where like, you're talking about shutting off like municipal water supplies. I mean, you, uh, you know, 80, 80 or 90% of the water is used by the agriculture industry. Um, and certainly if, if things keep trending the way they are, I mean, the, the Colorado river compact, the Colorado river is basically the river that, uh, and all of its tributaries that supply water to the entire American Southwest and some crazy number of tens of millions of people. Um, you know, that, that compact was signed in, in the third, I mean, we're really getting into water rights. Water rights are, are <laughs> that compact was, was signed at a, at a time when like the, the, uh, levels, even even in the historical context, it was signed in the 20s when the water levels were like much higher than they are typically. So mm. even before you factor in uh, climate change and like sort of the continuing Western drought, uh, that the Colorado River Compact was, uh, you know, uh, was was not going to produce some some real you know hard choices for for a lot of these states out here. And we're entering a period where and that's stuff stuff like that's gonna have to be renegotiated yeah that's that's good is colorado river the one that goes through phoenix too um uh, it doesn't get down to phoenix but it certainly uh a lot of it is you know transported down there right i mean yeah reading about aquifers and stuff like that is not uh the most existentially like cheerful uh sort of conversation <laughs> um, <laughs> no <laughs> Um, what, uh, you have a piece here in, uh, Colorado Newsline Chase that I thought was very interesting, uh, from, uh, earlier this February, uh, I'll put it up here and it's, uh, teachers, students protest new Douglas County school board, uh, Alleged school board's alleged plot to oust superintendent. Newly elected conservative majority has moved to reverse mask wearing equity policies. Uh, walk us through what. Uh, so, the re most recent election, I imagine they were running on uh, the sort of things like what's uh, what's going on here with this story. Yeah, so this is Douglas County. It's uh, South Denver suburbs. I think it's like the third largest school district uh, in the state. It was, uh, yeah, narrowly elected a new conservative majority in November. And uh, they, you know, pretty quickly got to work and uh, they rescinded the mask mandate, as, as you saw in that headline there. And there was an equity policy that was passed last year by the district. And, you know, it it's it's like a lot of these things that are being debated at school districts all over the country you know it was kind of just a fairly um you know in one sense uncontroversial sort of anti-bullying policy laying out some of these you know we, we we ran a story i didn't write the story but um my colleague reported um talked to students there who you know in this very pr pretty conservative south denver suburb um students of color who had faced like horrible bullying and harassment there. And so this equity policy was designed to, uh, to um, help ameliorate some of that. And uh, the conservative new conservative majority it's if, the, when they're on Fox news, they say they're getting rid of the equity equity policy when they're kind of talking to other folks here, they kind of say, no, we're, we just want to change it a little bit. Um, it's been kind of funny because they say that. And then you have like Chris Rufo on Twitter sharing stories, like <laughs> thanking them for gutting the equity policy. Um, so, you know, like I said, it, these, these are, these things are happening uh, in school districts all over the place, all over Colorado, all over the country. Now they are. And one thing that was interesting about this though, is there's a response to it. Uh, let us uh, give us what, what was the straw that broke the camel's back and how did people respond? Yeah. So um, kind of in 
pretty weird and dramatic fashion. The sort of, uh, this is a seven member board. The four new members are conservatives. The three mm -hmm. previous are, are kind of more progressive and the three members who are in the minority kind of uh, started blowing the whistle and, and holding these public meetings saying, we're hearing that the, the four new members are kind of secretly working to uh, fire the superintendent. And, you know, there were a bunch of different allegations made. I mean, you, you, it, it seemed to be a violation of kind of the district's personnel policies. There was like possible some, possibly some like open meetings. Like you can't have four members of a board decide behind closed doors to do something like this. They say they were kind of like playing phone tag and, and uh, I, I think it's like a walking quorum or a rolling quorum where none, no more than two of them were meeting at any time. So anyway, they, they uh, decided ultimately to fire the superintendent. It was this very, uh, long and weird uh, meeting where they wanted to go into executive session uh, to fire the superintendent. And the superintendent said, no, I'd prefer you to do this in per like out in public if, if you want to fire me. And they clearly were not prepared for that. They kind mm. of uh, couldn't really articulate why they wanted to get rid of them other than they just wanted to go in a different direction. And um, yeah, ultimately, you know, this guy who'd been the, with the district for 25 years and who, you know, prior to a few months ago, I don't think he would have had anybody complaining too much about uh, just got got the boot. And, uh, you know, who now they get to hire their their own superintendent, to sort of implement their vision for for this district. Right. So like the, they just saw that there was this equity policy and mask policy and they said, we just need to get rid of the super. That was the first, like, I, I mean, not to read into it, but it seems like that they're just looking for a reason and whoever was the superintendent at that time would have been uh, targeted. Yeah, I think so. And like, you know, um, I, I wrote that story. I went down, you know, as you were, as you were saying that there was, there was a reaction. There was a, in reaction to this, you know, kind of beloved 25 year veteran of the district being ousted. Um, there was a walkout. The teachers did a sick out. Students have done some walkouts. Um, there were, you know, in this kind of sleepy South Denver suburb, there was this big protest with a thousand people. And, you know, you talk to teachers and not to say that masks, the mask mandates and the equity policy aren't important, but there's a certain degree when you talk to teachers about this, like they understand, you know, what this, what this, new conservative school board majority wants in addition to get rid get getting rid of policies like that is you know to open more charter schools and to you know a really adjust kind of those fundamental structural issues that you know are always always up in the air for for um public education and so yeah like i i could imagine like certain teachers that maybe like they are like have got the same sort of Fox news concerns about equity policies. But when you start like blowing through procedure to like get rid of administrators, like I think everyone's going to be like, Oh, this is a little bit of a concern. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, there were definitely, t you know, I, I went down there kind of, uh, you know, I'd followed it a little bit and, and I was, there were several teachers I talked to. I was like, what do you make about the equity policy and the changes? And they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. We're, we're concerned about our pay and, and, you know what, what's going to happen to the the future of the district and 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 stuff like that. They they don't have a. It's not a school district that recognizes the um, teachers union and in, in terms of collective bargaining rights. Mm. So they're in that at that dis disadvantage too. Yeah, and the teacher sickouts thing was really interesting to me, uh, as uh, both that they had they had the organization capacity to stand up to those folks. I think they should be lauded for that. Uh, and also the reaction against it to try to discipline them back into, uh, the, I, I guess, in, into compliance. Uh, tell people about that a little bit. Yeah. So um, I, I believe, it, you know, when this sick out happened, there were kind of immediate calls from some like conservative commentators here to release the names of all the teachers who called out sick. Um, this is actually something that has it, they have attempted to do this before in a different school district here. And there was like a court case that, uh, you know, mm. uh, that ruled on whether um, the names of teachers who called out sick on a given day were like public record or whether that was like privileged personnel information. They ruled that it was public record. So um, it's a tactic that conservatives have used before here. The 
they did submit a public records request um, at one point to release all these names and, and it looked like it was going to happen. And then apparently the person who uh, submitted the request withdrew it. Uh, and, you know, I, I definitely talked to a ton of teachers down there who are, are pretty freaked out when they hear stuff like this, especially given how, you know, charged these issues have become for a lot of folks. We had an elementary school here, here in, in Denver public schools where a guy screaming about critical race theory, like lied his way onto campus and was like roaming the halls, oh, uh, accosting staff and parents. So, yeah. And I like, it's weird. Cause it's like, it's like, it's both a vehicle for people who are clearly like, you know, unwell to go into a school and yell at kids. And it also is, I think it, the main reason that say the Republican party is interested in this is because it's a Trojan horse for, to attack schools. Like we had um, mm-hmm. my buddy, Chris Leal is running for office in Dallas. And, and the way that the, like people in rural Texas uh, is what he's finding, like love their schools. They want their schools to be protected and invested in. And then you get this other sort of issue in there. And all of a sudden you're not talking about that sort of stuff again. What's the estate of, uh, of Colorado, like public education? Cause uh, I, I didn't want to follow up the uh, water uh, rights conversation with my, my question about pot. Um, but <laughs> my understanding, my understanding was uh, like, uh, you know, weed was supposed to lead to a whole bunch of new revenue and uh, finance things like education, stuff like that. Like uh, I, I know I didn't prepare you for this question, but where are we at with that sort of stuff? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a pretty common question. I mean, I, I think the, I mean, the, the specific, the answer to that specific question is just like the, the pot doesn't raise enough money. Mm. Uh, like people think, you know, it does raise a lot of money, but it, it, it's kind of a different scale when you're talking about schools. Mm. Um, the other thing it is like earmarked in the law that like it goes to capital costs for schools. So it like funds like the construction of new buildings Mm. um, and like not necessarily operational costs. Uh, But yeah, I think mostly the, the, the answer there is just that, which uh, not to say that folks, you know, this is wrapped up when when you ask about the state of public education here, like we're a pretty uh, hardcore, like ed reform, uh, charter school pro charter Democrat state. I mean, it, it, mm-hmm. it has been a big thing out here. Um, our current governor, Jared Polis, uh, made, uh, he's, he's uh, worth several hundred million dollars, uh, made a bunch of money in the dot com boom and has been a force in state politics for the last 20 years. And he got his start running for the state ed board and being a big proponent of the, of the charter movement here. That's, you know, as it does everywhere has, has a lot of, lot of funding behind it and you know there is still an attempt there was just a a ballot measure last year to hike pot taxes again a little bit and use that to fund kind of uh after school tutoring slash voucher very ed reformy stuff um and it failed so people are kind of sick of being told that pot is the answer (laughs) to all of our problems here (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe it's just a good thing to not criminalize that stuff uh, after all. That <laughs> yeah, that's probably fair. <laughs> maybe it yeah. doesn't need to solve the problem of public schools in America. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Chase, this has been a great conversation. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I can't recommend your piece uh, in the Substack uh, Lit Out West enough. Uh, uh, you know, this is it really speaks to me. The, you know, I'm all about the mythology that's being lost for folks. So. Um, uh, thanks so much at DC Woodruff. Give him a follow. Uh, Chase, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys.